Let's get cracking. Yeah, all right. Dang on. <coughs> all right, well, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so we're going to have a, you know, discussion about uh, sort of, you know, a Marxism 101, right? Kind of intro to Marxism um, for everyone. Now, this is a hugely complex, you know, school of thought spanning, what, like 160 years now and so on. So this is... This is just scratching the surface, but I uh, thought it'd be important to give everyone a good place to start because it is, well, it's one of the most uh, influential schools of uh, social science and political, political thought of the last two centuries, and especially on the left, right? Um, cool. So um, just, and just through all this, obviously anyone, um, I don't want this just to be a lecture for me, obviously I'll be talking a lot, but anyone who wants to step in, have any questions, thoughts, whatever, you know, put up your hands, uh, if you've got yeah. something to say, step in, I will be, uh, I appreciate that, we'll make it a bit more of a dialogue. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, I don't know if you guys have ever heard the, uh, there's a, f a phrase from uh, uh, American political activist uh, Bob Fitch that uh, vulgar Marxism explains 90% of the world, right? Uh, it's, it's sort of a... The useful thing is like even the even the most simple superficial version of Marxism is so incredibly powerful at just understanding the world around us. It's really useful to um, to understand. So a few things to start off with here, right? Marxism is not just the things that Marx said and thought, right? It's not you know this is not just oh Marxism is what Marx said, right? It's a whole school of thought that's been developed on for years and years and years, even the even the founding texts of Marxism were not just written by Marx, they were written uh, in conjunction with uh, with Engels, uh, with his wife Jenny, uh, Jenny von Westphalen, um, and with other activists at the time, right? And it's been developed hugely in time since. Also, it is not a, Marxism is not a, uh, a like a political program in the sense of like a way to organize a society. Like people sort of talk about, oh, Marxist societies or whatever. No such thing. Marxism is not a way to organize a society. It is a means of, of analysis of social phenomenon of history of economics, right? Um, Dialectical. Now, sorry? Dialectical materialism, which may ex explains how dialectics works. Mm -hmm. It's the evolution of human society from one form to another and how society evolves from one form to the next as it evolves from one form of societal ideology to another. And it's a scientific theory. It's scientific in, in the way it explains human evolution to get to capitalism, then how capitalism itself progresses and then moves to socialism and then communism. So it explains the progression of human society. Yes. Yeah, so it, it explains a lot about, like, uh, so yeah, Marxism, like, and we'll talk about historical materialism a lot later. Um, yeah, so Marx, is, so Marx predicted, you know, a transit, uh, 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 like, uh, humanity transcending capitalism and moving into uh, a socialist and then a communist form of society, but he actually had very little to say about what that would look like. He just sort of noticed the arrows pointing that way and, and uh, talked about... Uh, and talked about why it was and why he thought it was inevitable, um, or at least extremely likely. Okay, so um, a few things we'll just say about. Uh, we'll just start by talking a little bit about Marx himself because it's important to have a bit of context for uh, for where he got his ideas. Right. So he was born to a middle class family in um, in Trier uh, in Prussia. It's now uh, Germany uh, in 1818. So this is only three years after the final defeat of Napoleon, right, in, uh, at Waterloo. So he is born into the, he's born into, into the wake of the French Revolution, right? He is born into a world that has just been turned upside down by just an earth-shaking re revolution. And the whole of, the whole of European society was sort of still trying to process this, right? Um, he married uh, Jenny von Westphalen, who was a uh, young baroness who would uh, renounce her noble title. Um, and as a young man, he went to study uh, philosophy in university. Initially, he mostly just got really drunk and got in a lot of fights. Um, <laughs> like, 
Marco's ability, Marco's ability to just to get wasted and just get into massive fights with other people around him, the cops, uh, lamp posts at various points, it was kind of legendary. Um, but yeah. um, so he mostly just so for a while he just sort of got wasted and, and and so on, like as you know as many college kids do. But as time went on, he started to get really into philosophy, particularly the philosophy of Hegel, Georg yes. Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, yes. who was incredibly influential at the time. And so this is where it's important to understand. We're going to step step back a little more and understand Hegel so we can understand Marx. Um, okay, so Hegel was a philosopher who thought that history were he had a theory of history, a theory of history being driven forward by ideas and specifically by the conflict between ideas. So there'd been this long tradition in philosophy of like you have opposing ideas, you have like a thesis, an antithesis, they fight they fight it out, they achieve a synthesis, right? This goes back, I mean this goes back for I mean, almost certainly well before human history, but like famously you have like Socrates, right? You know, Socrates having his dialogues with people where, uh, you know, people would put forward different ideas and then they'd get sort of synthesized together and into some idea that would have the best parts of every, of all these sort of opposing schools here, right? But Hegel took this a step further. Hegel thought that that sort of argument, right? Like I come in saying one thing, you come in saying another, and through a process of discussion and mutual understanding, we come to a new idea which is, which has the strengths of both, but is it transcends, it transcends uh, either of what we came in with, right? We come to something greater. He thought that all of history was that. He thought that all of history was these opposing ideas clashing, uh, you know, coming into conflict, clashing, and creating a synthesis that pushed humanity forward to new heights of reason and freedom, right? So, it's important for us to understand Hegel. Hegel was an idealist. And I don't mean like as in he was, you know, starry-eyed, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if everyone's friends, you know, oh, you know, unicorns and rainbows. No, no, no. Hegel thought that basically all of the world is inside our heads. Hegel believed that the physical world we see around us is basically a reflection of ideas. And everything, and like, basically the ideas come first and the world around us comes second, right? And that all that we... All that we ever see, all that we inter ever interact with, is like a manifestation, is like a collective manifestation of our minds. Which is kind of, like, it's a pretty weird theory for a lot, for a lot of modern people to sort of uh, take into account, but it was, it, was a somewhat, it was a somewhat popular sort of view at the time, right? Um, it's the opposite of idealist is materialist, right? So idealist is everything, is like... Our minds are primary and our minds basically create the world. Materialist is the world exists and the, the world around us creates our minds, basically. Like, we, we learn from the world around us. Um, but yeah, so Hegel thought it was all, everything's basically kind of a projection of our minds, right? And the world is fundamentally about ideas and the conflict between idea, like spirit, will, that sort of thing. And he thought that this is what shapes all of human societies. We have these ideas. We, we have these ideas, and these ideas that we have at any given time create the society around us. That our social orders, like everything from our political structures to our ways of interacting with each other, our, uh, our economics, everything was a reflection of how we thought about the world. It was a reflection of our minds. Our minds come first, and then our ideas come first, and then the world is created from them. And, and so every society has its own ideology, its own giving, governing ideology that rules, that, that sort of determines uh, how things will be ordered, right? You know, what everyone's responsibilities are to each other, what everyone's, um, you know, the, 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 like what, what it means for things to be right or wrong, your, your rights, your duties, etc., right? But he also acknowledged that these would always be flawed. Any, any idea of a social order you have is going to be flawed in all sorts of ways, right? And there will always be an opposition that will arise out of it, right? When you live in a society, it's easy to, start, it's easy to see its flaws, and it's easy to start coming up with your own ideas in opposition to it to, uh, like to create an antithesis, right? The society is the thesis, 
And just by living in society, you see the cracks, you see all the, the spots where things aren't working right, you, the, and people start collectively creating the antithesis in their minds and sort of hatching this idea of an alternative society that would fix these, that would be, that would sort of fix these things. And over time, this antithesis sort of grows and grows and grows in people's minds until, until eventually you, it sort of, it breaks loose, it takes over. This, this new idea has sort of reached maturity, it overthrows the old, the old system and something new, uh, something new is created in opposition to what existed before. But that will also be flawed. That will also be flawed in all sorts of ways. There'll be all sorts of things that people did not think about when they tried to overthrow that old system. Yeah. And it will have all sorts of failings and shortcomings and so on. But then what will happen is through this thesis and the antithesis, people will learn what the well, people will learn from the mistakes of both and the uh, and the advantages of both and create a new synthesis, a new type of society that takes on the best of each of these. And then the process begins again. That new synthesis becomes the thesis. It will have to spawn an antithesis, there will be a synthesis, and so on, so on, and so forth. And this process will continue on and on and on and on. And at every stage, society gets better. It becomes more rational, it becomes more free, it becomes a better expression of humanity. And this is awfully abstract. And by the way, just a reminder, please stop me at any moment if you've got anything to add, any questions. This is awfully abstract. So let's try and make it concrete. The specific thing that was kind of inspiring this, and that is kind of the perfect uh, example of this, was the French Revolution, right? So, Hegel was mostly, Hegel was mostly sort of writing in response to the French Revolution, right? So in the French Revolution, you have a thesis, an absolute monarchy, right? The absolute monarchy uh, that was forged by Louis XIV, continued through to Louis the Sixteenth, right? Of the king rules all, you know, uh, you know, Louis XIV saying, you know, etat c'est moi, I am the state. Like, I, basically, I am the state, I am the country, I am everything. Everything flows through me. Mm. And it had all these old feudal obligations and so on, right? You had this extremely rigid hierarchy which you were born into. You know, king, lord, uh, peasants, etc. You all know about feudalism, right? Yeah. Uh, and this is basically kind of the highest stage of feudalism. This was sort of an advanced form of feudalism, this absolute monarchy. But it was flawed in all these ways, right? It had all these, it, like, it was it was extremely rigid. It couldn't uh, it couldn't adapt to new ideas uh, and so on. It was it was incredibly oppressive of the vast majority of the population. The vast majority of the population were a little better than slaves, and so you had something emerge as as a response. You had things like the you had Enlightenment thoughts start to arise, liberty, equality, fraternity, right? You had new ideas about, well, what if we base a society on reason and on, like, on reason, on science, on, you know, human equality, on merits, like, oh, you, you know, you achieve power through merit and so on, rather than being born into these positions, rather than being um, ruled by tradition and so on. And so you have, so in Hegel's view, these ideas sort of... <coughs> grow and, and grow in, in power and so on, as we philosophers think about these things, until you have a revolution. So he sees the French Revolution as being like the manifestation of these ideas breaking forth, shattering the old order and creating a new order. But as we all know, um, as much as the French Revolution was this incredible, it was this incredible uh, leap forward in terms of human history, and we all live in the shadow of it today, right? Uh, the, the early republic that was sort of formed out of it was also also had a lot of uh, shortcomings. It was extremely unstable. It was constantly like there were constant coups and counter coups, and you know massive riots in the streets, and you know it was sort of it. It could only be kept in power by you know huge slaughters in um, in places like the Vendee and so on. Um, it had a lot of flaws to it, right? So it was like, oh, everyone's free. You know, everyone's free. Everyone's equal. Uh, you know universal brotherhood and so on, but a lot of the things, the people who had come to these ideas hadn't thought through how do you kind of maintain order under these circumstances. So this flaws with the thesis, this flaws with the antithesis, it's the synthesis, Napoleon. You have Napoleon who basically takes 
aspects of both, right? He effectively, he institutes himself as emperor, right? And, and has a very rigid hierarchy, but the thing is that you, like, you have this rigid hierarchy, but it's a rigid hierarchy based on rationality, on merit. Like you get to the, these positions by uh, you know, showing your, your merit and so on. It preserves the, uh, the stability and order of the old monarchy with the... New uh, Republic. Sorry? The New Republic. Yeah, with the sort of, you know, with the kind of principles of reason and equality and, and, yeah. and, and, and you know, and freedom and so on of this republic, right? Yeah. He saw this as a synthesis, right? And so there's this famous uh, line about that from Hegel about Napoleon was history on horseback, right? Because he was going, because then he, you know, once he's sort of synthesized there, he then went through and basically, you know, kicked the ass of every king in Europe, basically being like, you know, boom, you're a republic, you're a republic, everyone's a republic, you know, fuck you if you don't like me, I am Napoleon, you cannot oppose me, you know. And uh -huh. my brother will be the king of that republic. And <laughs> exactly. And then the Crimean War happened and he ended up realising that was probably a big mistake to invade Russia if that was a big mistake. <laughs> yes, yes. That well, was a different Napoleon. That was, yeah, you're thinking of Napoleon the third. Um, yeah. the, but, uh, you know, first is, first is tragedy, then is fast, right? We're talking about the tragedy, the fast is yet to come. Um, <clears throat> so, um, no, so we got, uh, anyway, Napoleon was... Uh, so yeah, so this, is, this is how Hegel thought, right? This is sort of Hegel's read on how things, on how society progresses, right? That's all about the idea that you have a thesis, antithesis, synthesis, uh, that there is sort of, you know, you'll, a society will create an opposition which tries to, which solves a bunch of its problems but creates its own problems, and then the two will come together in a, in a synthesis, but it's all fundamentally about ideas. And, as, and by continuing to do this, we progress ever towards human freedom. Now, Getting back to Marx, there was a big argument between people who were fans of Hegel, because Hegel had recently died, and there were the young Hegelians and the old Hegelians. You had the people who sort of, because Hegel in his later years, most likely out of fear of getting his ass kicked by the Prussian government, because uh, the, uh, the Prussian kings, uh, you know, the, the uh, Prussian king was uh, not at all a fan of, uh, of revolutions, uh, unsurprisingly, and so sort of noticed in Hegel, it's like, uh. Oh, so you're saying that revolutions are inevitable and good, huh? Okay, so why exactly should you be allowed to keep your head? Please explain, right? Um, to which, you know, Hegel starts being like, um, and the perfect form of society, of course, has been realized here in Prussia. Every, this is the perfect society. Everyone should do exactly this. Uh, the king of Prussia is the, is the best ever. <laughs> Please don't kill me. Um, is what it basically comes down to, right? Whereas, of course, a lot of, and some of Hegel's fans sort of believe that, a lot of Hegel's fans sort of read between the lines is like, no, nah, no, nah, he's, he's very clear, revolutions, you know, revolutions coming and it's going to be great, right? So Marx was a fan of, was, was one of these young Hegelians, one of these people who's like, fuck yeah, revolution coming, let's go. So, this, I know it's a big digression, but it is philosophically important for understanding Marx later. So, basically, long story short, He's really into philosophy, particularly Hegel. He goes on, uh, tries to become a prof professor, uh, writes some really brilliant, influential uh, 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 works, which almost certainly would have gotten him promoted, except he got blacklisted because, yeah, the uh, king of Prussia was like, yeah, no, don't like the political associations, get out. That was um, his thesis on democratic, democratus and um, democratus and suffering. Yeah. yeah. So it was yeah. Democritus and Epicurus and then Metaphysics, yes. and you wrote a PhD thesis on it. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, absolutely. It's one of those ones I've mean, I keep meaning to read. I've never actually read it, but... Uh, it's on my desktop. I downloaded it, but it's daunting. It's, it's like 80 pages, so... And it's like, that's some old Metaphysics, man. I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm a fan of the... I'm a fan of, like, the pre-Socratics and so on, but, like, that's... Mm. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> But so he wrote this very influential, he wrote sort of very influential thesis that people were very impressed with, but they were also like, yeah, but no, nah. you're, you're wrong politics. Yeah. Um, so he became a, he became a newspaper editor, right? Um, he's like, okay, I'm a good writer. I can write about politics and so on. He started, he started being an editor for a left-wing newspaper. Long story short, because there's a bunch of, because this happens a bunch of time, he just keeps on getting himself into trouble by writing the wrong thing in a newspaper, yeah. getting himself kicked out of any of... Uh, one country after another after another. He just starts bouncing around, getting 
uh, pissing off the rulers of just about everywhere he settles in, gets caught up in the revolutions of 1848, particularly in France, which he, by this point, he's sort of, he's kind of, you know, gotten, he's, he's basically, he's become a, he's become a communist in, the, in sort of a, a sense we would understand now. He's not like, he hasn't fully developed his theories, but he's, he's very much adopted communism as a political philosophy. Mm -hmm. And 1848 comes around, he writes the Communist Manifesto, very famous book, which we'll, we won't talk about too much here, we'll talk about some of the theory related to it. Uh, and almost exactly, like, almost like the instance this arrives in Paris, like, I, think, I believe it was actually the very same day, because he was in Brussels when he was writing this, I believe it was the exact same day that this book, like, arrives for publication in Paris and, like, starts being spread on the streets, it's also the day of the February Revolution in Paris, so it like it coincide it coincides with this massive revolt that overthrows the government, and so people are in the mode of like, yep, yeah, sweet, kill the aristocrats. We've been through this before. We know how this works. Also, communism. Interesting <laughs> idea, huh? <laughs> well, what, what year was this? Eighteen forty-eight. Mm. Um, also, he was in the old. Him and Engels were also in the Prussian military because they were drafted at one point, and they had to flee to Switzerland. Yes, or Engels was, Marx wasn't. Marx fled before he had to join the military, but yes, yeah. Engels was, Engels had a whole other fascinating thing like leading an army against the Prussian uh, military. Engels being, uh, being sort of Marx's, you know, best oh, buddy. Uh, sugar daddy. Yeah, yeah, sugar daddy, basically. Well, his father was oh, a so industrialist, cute. so he needed the money in the capital to write his work and... Yes. He didn't want Marx to piss it against the wall, so he had to give it to him in small sums, so he didn't piss it against the wall, which is probably... Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> drip by drip. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. And, you know, yeah, so side note on angles. We're not going to talk about it too much, but for all of this, like, we're talking about all this, all these ideas, they're, they're all sort of ideas that Marx and Engels came up with together, right? Marx is usually sort of the, the name that gets put first. Um, but, uh, yeah, Engels was also a very important contributor son of a wealthy industrialist family uh, who basically, um, he, he started getting into a, a sort of radical politics. So uh, in their brilliance, they decided to send him to Manchester to look over one of their factories, which happened to be the most, the most industrialized town in the world at the time, which basically sent him from like lefty liberal to full out communist. Cause he's just, he just spends years walking around this place, like looking at the misery around him. He's like, Holy shit, my parents are the worst people on earth and every, like, them and everyone like them needs to die, basically. <laughs> They're doing that to these people, so, uh... Mostly poor Irish people as well. A lot of them are actually poor Irish labourers and poor and child children working in factories. If yeah. Living to be 40, you'd be a senior citizen. Mm. Yeah, and so he, he also writes uh, Conditions of the Working Class, which is a very influential book that he, he wrote, basically talking about the poverty there. Um, so yeah, in terms of like the the grand history of uh, conservative parents trying to de-radicalize their uh, their young children, uh, the Engelses sending their uh, kid to Manchester is probably it, it probably takes like number one spot as like worst move ever in terms of trying to de-radicalize your kid. Um, anyway, but so we're getting most of the way through through stories here, right? Basically, what what happens is 1848 comes around all through Europe, massive revolutions. And you see, you see revolutions where you have a coalition between the working class and the sort of bourgeoisie, right? The, uh, the business owners, the professionals, you know, your, your, your doctors, your uh, lawyers, your, uh, along with sort of your shop owners, your factory owners, etc., etc., are lying to overthrow the aristocrats. But when they succeeded, the professionals and uh, business owners would almost... In every in every case, almost immediately, negotiated for some concessions from the aristocrats, then turned around and crushed the working class. Yeah. And this this hit Marx particularly because Marx was one of the people who was very strongly arguing that the working class needed to ally with the bourgeoisie. He was one of the people who was trying to shout down a lot of the radicals who were saying, "No, no, working class needs to go it alone." He was saying, "No, no, no, work together, work together." Uh, and so a lot of his early writings afterwards. Uh, for example, 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, a huge amount of his bitterness and like talking about, yeah, all those fucking idiots who thought they could work with the bourgeoisie, he's mostly talking about himself, basically yelling at, yelling at his past self like four years earlier, being like, you fucking moron, you ruined everything, people listen to you and you ruined it, how dare you, etc. Um, but, so, 
After this, once again, failed revolution, well, failed revolution for the workers, successful revolutions for the wealthy, uh, for the, the, the wealthy communists, I should say, the sort of the business owners, professionals, etc. Marx flees to London, planning to return to the continent any day now, to, when the revolution kicks off once more, which never happens and he spends the next 35 years of his life, all the way up until he dies in London, constantly waiting for the revolutions to kick off again. But in this time, he comes up with his big influential theories and the basis of what we now call Marxism. So, biographical parts over, but hopefully that sort of gives some context for the ideas he's going to put forward. Yeah. Any questions about any of this so far? Comments, anything like that? No. Cool. All right. So, <clears throat> all right. So Marx spent a huge amount of time, you know, studying, studying production, studying political, uh, like, you know, political documents, production records, economic records, uh, lots of stuff. And he ended up sort of coming up with, uh, over the course of, yeah, the next 30 years or so, creating this, a whole bunch of works, including this sort of big final contribution, Capital, which, which was sort of like his big magnum opus. It was supposed to be seven volumes long. Uh, he only managed to get out one volume in his life and second and third were basically just angles, you know, doing that thing with a knife where you just sort of scrape the bits up that you can, you can get on your shopping board and just being like, yeah, sure, this is fine. Which is why, you know, Capital Volume 1, hard to read, but, you know, very, you know, extremely well written, like really, you know, really compelling writing. Chapters 2 and 3, it's just sort of like, it's a bunch of post-it notes stuck together into a book. Incredibly incis incisive and insightful, but not easy reading. But Marx in this, in this period, he starts trying to understand human society, human nature, and how political, how, how politics works and how political change works. And after a bunch of study, he kind of comes to the conclusion, okay, fundamentally, what are humans? Humans, because you need a sort of a, a theory of humanity to kind of have a, a theory of society, right? And he comes to the conclusion, the fundamental defining thing about humans is that we are, we are social laboring creatures, which is to say that unlike, unlike basically any other creature other than like ants and bees, basically, we cannot just live in the world as it exists. We must change the world around us to survive. Yeah. Right? Like most animals can sleep out in the open, can, you know, they don't, they don't need things like shelter. They don't need to make their own tools. They don't need to, like, their body provides them with what they need to hunt, to eat, to, you know, preserve themselves from the elements, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Humans aren't like that, though. We need to change the world around us to suit us. And we have to do that socially. No one human can ever, no matter how smart, no matter how competent, strong, healthy, whatever, will ever be able to produce all the things that they need to survive for any serious period of time, right? All these sort of stories you hear about, like a, a lone survivor out in, the, out in the forest or whatever, caring for themselves, literally has never happened. It's, it, just, it just doesn't happen. It's not possible, right? Sooner or later, sooner or later you'll make a mistake, you'll get yourself hurt, and you'll, you know, you'll get yourself hurt or you get yourself sick, and with no one else to care for you, you'll waste away and die. Right? Well, you'll go insane because you probably have no human contact, and you'll go insane because no human contact. <laughs> well, that too, yes. We, we, also <laughs> need, we also need other humans to keep us sane, as well as to keep our bellies fed and, you know, our skin on us. Um, you know, so we... So yeah, so we are social labouring creatures, right? And we, and we, we do labour, and this is including all sorts of labour, right? This is including uh, physical labour, emotional labour, mental labour, you know, thinking up new ideas, coming up, you know, making tools, uh, caring for each other, all this sort of stuff. All this stuff goes into, you know, maintaining life. And we do it not only to preserve ourselves, to keep living another day but also to give us meaning right this is what gives us meaning if we don't have something useful to do we go insane right we yeah. we have mental health issues we get depressed we get you know we get anxious we get you know all sorts of things right and so he starts to have this he starts to think okay what if what if it's production that dictates society what if the fundamental thing that sort of dictates 
how society runs is the underlying production, the, the, how it produces the things you need to, to live, right? Food, shelter, fresh water, all that sort of stuff, right? It's basically saying, okay, food and shelter first, ideas come later. Your, your ideas are shaped. It's not that, it's not that you know, your, your ideas are shaped by the, uh, by the realities under which you live your life. You create things you need. And so here he comes up with the ideas of base and superstructure, right? That how that we have base, like how we make the goods of life, how we make all the things we need. Yeah. And then superstructure, which is sort of built on top of that, which is how we think about the world, our understanding of who we are, what we are, how we interact with each other, what society is, what's right, what's wrong. Um, you know, this is everything from law to culture to morality to philosophy to language, right? That is, that is secondary to just making stuff to live another day. Yeah. Now, these things can inform each other, right? So superstructure can, so how we, you know, how we live out, like how we think about the world can influence how we do production and so on. But he's basically saying the primary arrow of, of cause and effect, it goes from production to culture, right? Um, cool. Uh, yeah, all right. So he has this, so then he sort of starts thinking about, uh, about how this, like, okay, we, we start with, we start this sort of idea of like, we, you know, everything is based on production, right? So then he starts thinking, okay, so why is it that we have classes between people? Why is it that some people are, you know, have this sort of power over others? And it comes with this idea that if you have a society that can't, like it comes down to surplus, right? It comes down to the idea that at a certain point of development, one person's work, the, the amount of work that someone does in a day can produce more than they need to just survive for the next day. Yeah you have surplus, right? You can produce more in a day than you need to survive to the next day. And so then if you have that, you can sort of think of it from a societal level. Well, there's two options what to do with that. Either everyone can just sort of take some time to chill, you know, have some time off, or some big guy with a big stick can, hit you, can threaten to hit you over the head unless you give him uh, some of your stuff, right? So if you're producing 10% more than it takes you to, uh, to survive to the next day, well, one guy with a big stick can just threaten uh, can just threaten ten people and get hundred percent of of what he needs for the day, right? So you start getting a class. You start getting class structure. You start getting a sort of a ruling class and a working class, right? An oppressor and oppressed. Yeah. You get people who do all the work that's actually needed for society, and you get people whose lives are based on like parasitically extracting from them. Now, to be clear, one thing that's super important here, right, is that that doesn't include people like, that doesn't, like, you don't have to be directly producing, like, food to be someone who's, you know, productive, right? So, like, if you're making the tools that people need to make someone to make uh, food, right, if you're making tools for a farmer, that's still socially useful labor, right? Because the work you're putting in saves the farmer work. You know, the, if you're, uh, you know, if you're ferrying goods backwards and forwards between, you know, between farms and a town, right? You're still putting in useful work. Basically, if you're doing anything that's essential to make the society work, you're still putting in, like, you're still part of the labor process, right? And as time goes on, fewer and fewer workers will be part of the sort of very direct, like, make the food part yeah. of it. Yeah, and that's when you look at the Industrial Revolution and how that changed things because Britain was an agriculturally based economy, predominantly farming and rural. And with industrialization, then a lot of those workers who were agricultural workers had to become industrial workers because industry took over agriculture and the farmland became industrialized. The workers had to leave their land and they had to go to cities to work and work as factory workers. So the whole dynamics at that point was changing. Yeah, yeah, uh, and we'll we'll get to that in a in a second too. Yeah, yeah. so okay, so we're talking about like we've got a, a class structure here, right? So yeah. you know you can have and as and 
through history there's been various forms of you know oppressor class you know forms of oppressor and oppressed right uh you've got everything from sort of uh priests uh like priest classes who sort of claim rule by uh by being divine so think like um think the pharaohs of egypt right you know the pharaohs the pharaohs of egypt and their and their priest class managed to rule over everything by convincing everyone that uh you know that the pharaoh is literally god right the pharaoh causes the, the nile to flood you know without me the nile will not will not flood you will not have have your food you know bow to me and give me food for i do this great thing for you right etc obviously backed up with a fair bit of violence but yeah uh, you can have things like claiming ownership over people, right? Slavery, yeah. claiming ownership over land, etc. There's all sorts of justifications, right? But the point is, it starts with the it starts with the "Oi, give me your shit, or I'll beat you up," and then the uh, and then the justifications of "Oh no, give me your shit because um, I'm God and uh, the the ground's only fertile because I say it should be." That all comes later, right? And so then he starts saying, "All right, well." He, he sort of figures, okay, from that point, this is where you start to get the emergence of a state, right? Because a state, like as in, you know, a government, a, a body of, uh, of armed people that can force law uh, over a over population, right? A state is a, is basically a mechanism for the oppressors to keep the oppressed in line, right? A state is the mechanism of repression and control of society by the people at the top. So, um, and so, because obviously part of the nature of having this sort of exploiter exploited class system is that naturally there are going to be a lot more people at the bottom than at the top, right? And so if all the people at the bottom just say, oh, wait, fuck off, it's pretty hard for, like, there's not much that the, you know, the oppressed can overthrow the oppressors at any time if they can coordinate, right? And so you need to have some sort of mechanism of putting down any of these little, you know, sparks of revolt before they catch into a wildfire. Okay. And so, yeah, so the idea is that the nature of these, of, of these classes have changed over time, but every society, every society that has had agriculture basically has had this class conflict because when you have agriculture, you have surplus. When you have surplus, you will have a class system. Right, uh, or at least so far, um, and so all you know, all societies that have had agriculture up to this day have had a class structure and therefore a state. So here's where we get to the idea of class conflict, and you know, one of Marx's most famous quotes, and it's just a great one. So like, I'm just going to quote it. Right, <clears throat> the history of all hitherto existing society is a history of class struggle: freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf. Guild master and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended, either in revolutionary reconstruction of society at large, or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Yeah. Right? Famous, famous line uh, from be uh, beginning of the Coming Manifesto. Yeah. yeah, just after he talks about the spirit pointing Europe, right? Yeah. Um, he could have been a wobbly. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Look, the Wobblies, I believe the Wobblies formed like only a few years after his death, but he, he, he would have been a big fan, no question. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, he, he sort of takes this idea of, okay, society is fundamentally dictated by conditions of production, and excess production leads to a class, a class system, and a state enforcing that class system, and so he then takes this to mean, okay, all societies, therefore, because they have this class system, are defined by constant, ongoing, unending class conflict. And it can take on various forms, but there's always this conflict because there are conflicting interests, right? So, he saw all societies as being dictatorships of a ruling class over the rest of society. And, but the rulers are not in total agreement, right? So a good example of a, a case where you have internal fights within a ruling class is when you have something like, um, okay, things like the Adani mine, right? The Adani mine, the sort of controversy of the Adani mine, the reason why this sort of, the amount of dissent that exists to it has been tolerated is because capital is not uniformly on board with it, right? Not all the capitalists want the Adani mine to go ahead because for example, 
uh, any of the capitalists who own hotels and like tourism uh, businesses up in uh, up in yeah Cairns, North Queensland, you know, all all in Great Barrier Reef, they are for they are understandably shitting themselves over it because they're like no 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 we you know we make all our money off having all that beautiful all the beautiful sea life and all that. I mean we don't, we don't give a shit about the turtles and all the rest, but like if they make us money then yeah yeah don't like don't mess with that right we don't want you dumping all your all your shit into the ocean whereas the coal miners are the the, the uh, sort of the people who own the coal mines are like no no, no 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 we need to dig this stuff out we need to be able to dump our waste as cheaply as possible right there's an internal contradiction there among the capitalists right they're both they're both united on on things like well keep the working class down don't let in don't let them sort of you know uh rise up and cause any problems for us but they've got internal conflicts about what their interests are, you know, what, what gets precedent. My profits are your profits. So you can have internal contradictions in the ruling class. So we've got, and so because of this, because there are these internal contradictions, you'll have all sorts of political structures for trying to resolve these contradictions, right? And so one, one manifestation that can take, is can take on the appearance of democracy, as in, uh, as in our, our society. Now, note I said the appearance of democracy, because it is, of course, it's still a dictatorship of, of a ruling class, but it can take on an appearance of things like democracy. So, for example, in our democratic structures that exist right now, democratic structures, right, in Parliament, there are all sorts of things you can vote for, right? You know, uh, politicians could put forward all sorts of things about, you know, oh, should we... Um, you know, oh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll shift the taxes up or down on, on sales versus, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, versus financial transactions, or we'll, you know, we'll put a bit more money into, um, into this type of industry versus that type of industry and so on. And we can, and those are sorts of, those are in, internal conflicts among the, among capital. And it's like, those are parts of the legitimate discussion, right? But for example, you can't have like, the, the Australian government won't tolerate a party being elected that just sort of says, yep, let's seize all the, let's seize all the capital, let's seize all the, uh, you know, everyone who's got, you know, if you've got more than a million dollars, uh, we're confiscating it, right? You know, everyone in Australia who's got more than a million dollars worth of assets, we're just confiscating it, right? If a party went forward and put forward that platform and got elected um, somehow, there would be an immediate coup, right? They would immediately get crushed. A uh, perfect example of this is uh, Chile, right? Chile under Allende, they democratically elected a government that tried to take the uh, tried to take the uh, capital through, you know, sort of official legal means of uh, of you know uh, parliamentary democracy and all the rest. Uh, to which you know, to which the response was, uh, "Fuck you! You're all you all get shot and free helicopter rides for anyone who uh, disagrees," right? Okay. Um, he didn't control the state. That was a problem. Well, he yes. only had control of the old. He only had the gov power, government power, not state power, because the apparatus of the state was still on the side of the of the ruling class. So he didn't get them on side. Big mistake. Well, exactly, and also, I mean, and also, he didn't arm his people. That was another mistake. He he uh, he had the opportunity to, uh, you know, basically pass out guns far and wide to the people of Chile. Who were very much on his side, and uh, he decided not to take that opportunity. But yeah. basically, the idea being, you have all these, you have all these official, these, you can have like official democracy. But the point is, the state fundamentally exists to maintain the power of the ruling class. And if you try to, you know, if you try to use it within that, you know, within the sort of legal systems to go against its purpose, it will just turn against you and, and tear you apart, basically. Yeah. Right. So, state fundamentally exists to protect the oppressors from the oppressed. Yeah. Um, okay. So, if the state, so the state exists as this manifestation of class conflict, right? As a, yeah. as a, to keep class conflict, uh, well, to keep it suppressed in favour of the ruling class, right? And so we yeah. ask things like, what is class conflict, right? Class conflict exists everywhere in our, in our society. It is, like... Okay, when I went to the supermarket to buy uh, to buy ingredients for uh, you know uh, for for dinner for everyone, right? There was class conflict going on on there, right? Because 
I'm in an interaction with a, a, a corporation that exists, that exists basically as the representation of the will of a bunch of capitalists, right? And in that situation, I have an interest in the prices being as low as, as possible. They have the interest of having those prices be as high as possible, so long as they can, uh, so long as they can take my, my money, right? Yeah. I have an interest in having high quality products. They have an interest in selling whatever's cheapest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The people working in that store, right? They have an interest in uh, in being paid more and being given more flexibility. The capitalists have an interest in keeping their pay as low as possible and keeping them regimented. Almost, almost every interaction we have with, you know, in, in our society, contains this seed of class conflict within it. Yeah. Class conflict is like we're marinating it, right? It's like you don't notice it in the same for the same reason fish don't notice water, right? We are just it is it is everything. So, yeah. So it's it's class conflict is like these examples of situations where there are irreconcilable interests, right? Like when a work, you know, so if you're, you know, if you're trying to work, uh, if you're trying to negotiate a higher wage with your boss, right, and, you know, they're off to try and give you a lower wage, there's an irreconcilable, like, zero-sum game there, right? Yeah. Every dollar you gain is a dollar he loses. So that, like, at that point it can't, like, there's no sort of compromise you can come to where you both benefit. It just comes down to, well, who's got the power, right? Do you have, you know, can you... Can you stage a strike? Can you have some sort of plausible threat, whatever? Can he bring in the cops? Can he, you know, have you blacklisted and whatever, you know, oh, yeah. ruin your life? So it comes down to a sheer contest of force and power. Um, okay, yeah. So, So the idea, and, and so the, another thing that's worth noting here is that there aren't necessarily just two classes. Like in modern capitalism, we sort of, we often simplify it down to there being two classes, but there can be more than that. And in reality, there are, you know, there are more than two classes in, in our modern world that exists, right? Like you have peasants versus industrial workers versus, uh, you know, uh, you know, versus uh, capitalists versus et cetera. Like you can have people who have different relations to uh, to the economy, right? Um, okay. And, and, and part of this, uh, and an important thing here is that classes can rise as the economy shifts. So we're starting to get into like historical ma ma uh, materialism here, right? But you can have a situation where, as economic progress happens, uh, as, as sort of as, uh, or basically as the circumstances of the world change and therefore production changes, you know, your tech changes, the environment changes around you, uh, you know, whatever, uh, population shifts, uh, either moves physically or there's a lot of people die or a lot of people are born, whatever. This can change the character of, of an economy and can change the character of an economy and changes the character of the society, right? And so these production shifts will necessarily start to shift how people think about the world, right? If labor dictates, and if labor and production dictates our society, how we think, how we manifest in the world, then shifts in production will change our minds, will change our consciousness, will change our character as humans, right? Will make us at some level fundamentally different types of creatures. And so when that happens, you can start to have conflicts between people's lived experience, like the, the ideas that are arising from their work, and the ideological structures that have been built up. Now, if this is sounding familiar, now we get back to Hegel, this is Hegel flipped on its head, right? This is the whole thing about Hegel saying, oh, well, ideas, you know, you have new ideas rise up to uh, to challenge, you know, to challenge the old ideas and create a new society. And Marx is saying, no, other way around. Production, so like the, the production of the, like the, the sort of physical aspects of society, production creates the new ideas, right? Production creates the new idea, uh, the new ideas and the production, the changes in productive forces cause society to rupture and go through a revolution. Yeah. Right? 
because old systems, old systems of ideas simply do not apply anymore. They simply do not work for the structures that have been created. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, classic example being, going back to that French Revolution, right? Marx would say, Marx would say, no, 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 Hegel fundamentally got it wrong. It's not that the idea, it's not the French Revolution happened because people had these new ideas. If people had these new ideas because the economy had shifted, it wasn't just a, a society where everyone was, you know, was, where, like, the production was mostly happening with peasants on farms, right? Where you could just have a lord who, you know, rules over a, a piece of land and everyone's bounded to the land and they, you know, they harvest their crops and they send some to the lord and then everything's, uh, and then, you know, everything just stays the same, right? More and more production started to shift to, oh no, we've got all these, we're, we're in, we're in uh, cities and stuff and we're doing, and we've got all these guilds that are like making all these goods that are being traded across borders and we've got, and we're, we're uh, we're doing trade with uh, with the Americas and with the you know with with Asia and of course all the you know all the plunder and so on coming from the Americas as well uh, plays a part and suddenly things like trade and like secondary production like like producing producing all these like tools and luxuries and all the rest this starts to become more and more of the economy the economy becomes less about like a guy in a field on a farm you know harvesting wheat. And it becomes far more like that becomes more and more of a secondary aspect of the economy as it's pushed aside by like merchant class merchants artisans yes. all this sort of stuff right so Marx is saying no 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 it's not like the society didn't change uh, the the it's not that the economy changed because people's ideas changed it's people's ideas changed because they were living in cities they were being artisans they were being these merchants etc etc and so the ideas that suit the ideas that arise from that mode of living, of being a merchant, are the ideas of the Enlightenment, are the ideas that take over the society. Yeah. And so when they, when the French Revolution came in, one of the things that, you know, a lot of things they did, right, were they were abolishing a lot of things that made sense for feudalism, but didn't make sense anymore for a merchant class, right? They were abolishing old, uh, all these, you know, hundreds of old treaties, years old treaties about like, you know, oh, well, you know, the Duke of such and such will, shall receive, you know, three shillings per year from his peasants uh, so that they can import, you know, uh, sea salt from the, from the coast or whatever. And all these, you had all these like patchwork deals that had been made centuries ago, case by case, with no sort of foresight, that just didn't work anymore for a, a modern society, right? You needed something rational, you needed something uniform, you needed something that like had been sort of planned out in advance. And you needed people to be able to move around. You needed workers in the city to start making, start working in these factories, right? Start making all this new shit. But all the, all the peasants were legally bound to their lands. The, the peasants literally were not allowed to move. They uh, were not allowed to move off their farms into the cities. So you started. So you had things like the you had things like the English Civil War and the French Revolution, specifically so that you could break these old uh, feudal orders, right? So that you could break these things that were holding back production, holding back the production of the, the creation of these new factories, these new uh, of sort of new trade routes, all this sort of stuff, so that the economy could move forward. Now I should be clear: this wasn't all nice. This was. Uh, this was actually in many ways absolutely fucking horrible for the peasantry, right? The peasantry, it wasn't like, oh, you're free now, you're no longer bound to your land, you may go to the city. Like, I mean, they could go to the city, but the, the way they experienced it was, was usually more like, oh sweet, this collective uh, piece of land that, you've, that you and your ancestors, you know, you and your parents and your parents' parents have had for like uh, 1500 years, yeah, that belongs to uh, this dude. Yeah, you never met, met him before? Uh, he just owns a lot of slaves in Cuba. Like, that's, basically, he's just incredibly rich because he just owns a lot of people and like, you know, and they get their arms ripped off by the machine to make sugar and stuff, but like, oh, it doesn't benefit you, but like, those people over there, they love the sugar. Anyway, the people, you know, people in the city, they love sugar. Anyway, he owns your shit now, um, you're all completely broke and, uh, yeah, if you want to survive, better move to the city and become an industrial worker and work 16 hours a day. Uh, sucks for you. Um, we well, would take your kids and put them in, a, in a, one of those little slate houses they used to have in all the twist with those the workhouses. Yes, the workhouses. Oh, yes. Yes, exactly. So it was... <clears throat> so, yeah, so this... 
this shift, right? This, and so, so the way Marx would see it is, this shift was, it was progressive in the sense that it advanced the material production, productive forces of society, right? So Marx is seeing this all as, okay, ultimately this is, you know, this is all about increasing our ability to produce the things that we need as a society. And on that front, the Industrial Revolution was an enormous success. On a humanitarian level, it was an utter fucking disaster, right? <laughs> it was just catastrophic. I mean, yeah. leaving aside all the people who got chewed up by the machines, uh, you know, the, the degree to which like the extermination of the native peoples of the Americas and the enslavement of millions of Africans, like that was absolutely a necessary part of industrialization and so on. Yeah. Um, not to mention getting half of China hooked on opium and oh. all the other... And then fighting a war over it when the Chinese are like, no, you can't get our people addicted to opium. And then they said, okay, then we'll take Hong Kong for 120 years and give it back to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, in, you know, enslaving most of, uh, most of India, just a, yeah, just an absolute, you know, laundry list of horrifying crimes against humanity. All this was, all this was part of it. But, and so, and so one of the things you find with, you know, you'll find in Marx is, interestingly enough, you'll find all these parts where Marx will be, he'll, he'll be praising, like, he'll be like, oh my god, capitalism has created all this, you know, all this productive capacity, like, my god, we can produce all these things more than we ever have before. And he'll be, like, acknowledging, oh yeah, no, that's, that's amazing, that's an amazing advancement, before jumping back to, you bloodthirsty bastards who have done all this horrifying shit, you know, how dare you. Um, yeah. But... But he sees this as the next step in, in the development of, uh, of our productive capacities. Okay, Whew, we've been going on a long time. All right, we've been going on like an hour now. Um, but we're getting close to the end. So this is where we get to capitalism. Okay, I've been talking for far, far, far too long. So I'm going to get someone else to, I'm going to get someone else to explain how does, uh, well, what's capitalism? Can someone, give me, can someone give me a definition of capitalism? Yeah. It's a social relation between oppressor and oppressor and the means of production of labour. Uh -huh. Between the workers and their means of production of labour and the production of labour to produce capital surplus. So, for example, this phone made in oh, China. Yeah, China, Korea, something like that. Where anyway? Well, well, okay, made in China. It cost what for you three, four hundred bucks, seven hundred maybe, seven hundred for that. But the work, the parts on this are probably not worth seven hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. The retail value of this phone is seven hundred dollars. Yeah. And the workers get not paid the cost of surplus labour to produce that phone because <clears throat> that phone is. No, they're not getting part of the full cost of the selling of the production of that phone. Because that's where profit comes from. Yeah, exactly. That's where profit comes from. Bingo, that's what it is. Spot on, spot on, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, capitalism is yeah, capitalism specifically is the is system where where uh, capitalists own this they own this sort of this means of production, this productive capacity this productive equipment, right? Tools, machinery, uh, you know, the, the raw materials that go in, all this sort of stuff, right? pay people who are, you know, pay people to work on them to produce a product, but only pay them some small fraction of the value, of the total value they've created, right? So, uh, so there's a famous thing, so, a famous example of like, um, okay, like, let's say you've got, uh, let's say we're all making shoes, right? We're, we're in a factory uh, making shoes, and... <clears throat> So I'm the, you know, I'm the capitalist and you're all, I, I've employed all of you to make, to make shoes. So I'm sitting back in my, uh, in, in my office feeling pretty good about myself. Now I've done the calculations here and once you take into account all the costs of materials and so on and so forth, uh, after about four hours of labouring, you will have made uh, enough shoes for, uh, to produce every, like you will have produced enough shoes that when they're sold, they will yield enough money for you to pay for food, rent, etc. all the stuff you need to survive, right? Which one would I pay you, right? I'm paying, I'm paying you what you need to survive. So you've done that after four hours. But for me, that's just a break-even point. Like, for me, after four hours, I'm just, I've only, I've only got to zero, right? 
my profit comes in when you work, work that fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth hour, right? Because yeah. those hours are the hours in which I get rich. So my incentive is always going to be to work you longer and harder and to find ways to pay you less, right? Find any way to squeeze you, right? Be it, uh, be able to, so I, I can pay you less so that that sort of hour of where I break even, oh, maybe if I pay you a little less, I can figure out a way to do this. Maybe I start making profit after three and a half hours instead of four. Maybe I can even get down to three hours, you know? And so the key thing here, right, is that is that profit is the unpaid wages of labor. Yeah. Right? You have, <clears throat> you have people who have a monopoly over the use of the, uh, the tools, the tools of, of production, of, you know, talking about capital here, right? Monopoly over capital, who use that power to extract the value that other people create. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is good, all right. And a big part of that is when I extract that value, right? So I got you to work for four hours and then, uh, you know, to, to pay your wage and then the next, then another, let's say another four, uh, and that other four is profit for me, right? That profit. Now some of that I'm gonna use, on my, I'm gonna just use to pay for my own living expenses and so on, you know, give me a nice place to live, uh, some, you know, some, yeah, some good, good quality scotch, you know, pay for some nice holidays and so on, but, but, if I got like a hundred of you working here, like I got like a hundred people's, you know, I got like a hundred people's uh, worth of living expenses here as my, like, as my profit, I'm going to reinvest a bunch of that, right? Yep. And I'm going to buy new tools, new tools that will let you make more shoes, right? With less people. With less people, spot on. So that means that I'm going to start breaking the, uh, I'm going to start breaking even earlier and earlier, right? And I don't need as many people anymore. Yep. Yes. And also there's the competition of mechanization too. So if you decide you get you buy more tools, the bloke next door buys a machine that can make that can do the job faster, produce more products and then make more capital, then you have to update your equipment to compete with him because the competition comes from capital too. Yes, yes, spot on. And now we're starting to get into the crises of capitalism. Uh, but yeah, so uh, there's a great uh, analogy that Marx uses here, right? Because one of the things that's, a, that's important, right, is that all these tools that I'm buying, that I'm buying to improve the production process, right? These were all, like, these aren't just conjured out of nowhere when I pile up a bunch of money, right? It's like, you know, I'm buying, if I'm buying a, a you know, a machine that will uh, help make, you know, rubber soles for these shoes much faster, it's not, I don't just pile up, you know, $3 million into a big pile and, you know, say some sort of rights and then, you know, the demon of automation rises and, uh, and you know, hands me the machine, right? No, 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 that's, that's the product of other people's labor. So that is, you know, other people's human labor has gone into making this machine, yeah. but this machine will then reduce the need for, for human labor in the future, right? Yeah. So this machine is like a crystallized piece of labor, right? Mm -hmm. Capital is... Capital is like mm. is crystallized labor, and so Marx has this analogy where he talks about capital as dead labor that vampirically can, that can only live by vampirically sucking on the blood of the of the living, right? That I can that this machine this machine produces incredible amounts of value, but it produces but in the context of these social relations, it produces that value by extracting yours. Now, if you own, if, if the workers own the machines, this would be, there, there'd be nothing vampiric about this, right? Yeah. If the workers own the, the machines, then it's like, oh sweet, this machine means we can make more shoes in the, in the same amount of time. Okay, sweet. So then the only question is, well, do we work shorter hours and have more time off or do we just take home bigger paychecks? You know, yeah. but since I'm only paying, I'm still paying you the same amount of, uh, as, uh, as ever, but maybe I'm firing a few of you and, and so on. This... This uh, this uh, chunk of dead labor starts to become yeah, it starts to become parasitic, starts to become vampiric, sucking yeah. at your at your uh, dead labor, sorry, at your living labor. And as you said, Sam, uh, then if I buy this machine, right, yeah. people next door they're going to start buying it. They're going to buy a machine too, right? Yeah. It's going to uh, maybe an even better one, right? And 
So when I get in my machine, yeah. I can maybe profit for a bit, uh, profit a bit more for a while, right? Because I can, uh, my profits might increase because I can make the same number of shoes with fewer laborers. So yeah. sweet, this is awesome. But then the person next door, they buy an even better machine, right? And they decide to undercut me by uh, cutting their prices, right? So they say, all right, you know what? You've been selling for 50 bucks, I'm selling for 45, right? Watch me take all your, all your customers. So then what I gotta do is I gotta start undercutting him. And so as this production goes on and on and on, the capitalist starts to, they start to eat into their own share through their competition with each other. Yeah. Right, and there, thus we have the tendency of the rate of profit to fall because, yeah. because here's the key thing here, right? If profit is the unpaid wages of labor, and constant, and they're constantly reducing the amount of labor they need, they're constantly reducing the amount of labor they can bite into. This is a really is hard. Is I don't know. I found this a rather hard concept to sort of get my head around when I first mm -hmm. first encountered it. But this is this is really key, right? as you increase the amount of automation in an industry, right? And to be, to be clear, this is like competitors, you know, in an arms race of automation, right? I'm trying to automate as fast as, as I can and Maury's trying to automate uh, as fast as he can with his, with his own factory over there, right? Every time, we, every time we do this, we're undercutting each other's profits and we're reducing the amount of labor that is, uh, that is needed. But if our profits come from the unpaid wages of labor, and less and less of the value of our production is coming from living labor and more of it's coming from dead labor, then there is a smaller pool of living labor to cut into, to like take a share out of, and therefore our profit will fall and fall and fall ever more. Interestingly enough, this is actually historically very much being borne out, right? The only periods when, um, so profits have fallen pretty consistently throughout uh, the history of the 160 years or so since Marx sort of made these, predict made these uh, predictions. Uh, the only times when the profits have gone back up again have been in periods of either expansion into new markets when new markets have opened up or in periods of destruction when you've had something like a massive world war to just like basically shatter all the machines and so you have to go back to using a whole lot more labor and so the rate of profit starts to go back up again. Yeah, and that's why you see right wingers, there's their sick fascination with the 1950s because that at that point, post World War II, all the industry in Europe was wiped out. So <clears> the Yanks became really rich. The Australians got their economy up. The other countries could then compete because there was no longer a European market. Absolutely. Well, and you had, and you had an entire world's worth of, uh, of uh, you know, of uh, of markets you could sort of, you know, you could squeeze, right? I mean, even even though the empires were falling, you know, you still had they just found new ways of squeezing those. But yes, yes, absolutely. After wars, when you know, when all the machines start getting smashed, that competition drops way off, and the profits go back up again. But inevitably, they start falling again. So we've got tendency of the rare profit to fall. We've got crises of overproduction. Can they, does anyone here want to uh, describe what a crisis of overproduction is? Anyone know what a crisis of overproduction is? Yeah? Can I can give it a shot. Yeah, go for it. Like, uh, this time in history is the only time we've ever been able to overproduce more than we need through the capitalism of overproduction. Uh, mm -hmm. The crisis like, is in no, we can overproduce and we have issues that come with overproduction, but we, we are unable to uh, distribute the resources we actually have around to everyone. Market saturation. Once there's too much product, there's no there's too much product being sold. Then the demand goes down because there's too much product. And of course, once that product is overproduced, then the profit from that product is no longer of any use. So then the price of it goes down. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. So a good way of thinking about this is let's go back to that shoe factory I was talking about, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so. I'm, you know, I'm making these, I'm making these shoes, right? And just to make the maths nice and simple here, right? We're saying, you know, of the value of, for value of any given shoe being sold, half the value is going to the workers, half the value is going to the capitalists, right? Keep it nice and simple, right? So I'm, you know, I'm selling these shoes for, uh, you know, I'm selling these shoes for 40 bucks. Workers are getting 20, I'm getting 20 yeah. out, of, out of this, right? Here's the thing though. When those workers need to turn around and buy shoes, they've got 
So the workers are buying shoes. They're buying shoes out of their wages, right? Now the thing is, if all production is being done under a capitalist, uh, under a capitalist mode here, right, where only a fraction of the value that is, uh, let's say, only a fraction of the cost of the sort of price of the shoes is actually being paid of, of, of all the products in society, I should say, is being paid out in the form of wages. That means that there will not be enough money around to buy up all the goods that are being produced. Right? If workers are doing are buying up the products, but the products are worth the total of all the value of all the products in the society, the total of the price of all the products in society is more than the total of the value of all the like, purchasing power of all the wages in the society, then that requires that a huge amount of mer merchandise is being thrown out. There isn't enough money to buy everything. Yeah. So this is where you get very strange situations, right? Because a crisis of overproduction is, should be an absurdity, right? It's like, the problem is there's too much stuff. We've got too much good stuff in the world and that's why everyone's poor. Because, because here's what because here's what happens, right? I'm running my shoe factory, and I, you know, okay, we're we're making so many shoes. My God, look at these projections, so many shoes. <clears throat> my God, you know, this is, this is fascinating. Just look at this. Um, according to this, we've made uh, twelve billion pairs of shoes this year. How many people are there in the world again? Fuck. Right. Uh, okay, we've got more shoes than there are people to buy shoes. Oh dear. Okay. All right. All right. Here's what's going to happen. All right, we're not going to be able to sell these. I got an idea. We'll fire a bunch of the workers because we don't need to keep making shoes. We've got too many of them. We don't need to keep making shoes. We'll fire a bunch of the workers. That'll uh, they'll do. They'll cut our expenses for a bit, and we'll just sort of hold on to these for a while, and we'll just sort of keep on selling off. In the next few years, we'll just keep on selling off the existing stock we've got. Right? That'll work great. Right. Simultaneously, every other capitalist is doing the same thing. Right? They're uh, they're in a situation where they've produced too much, and uh, they've. Uh, and so they're sort of sitting on their supplies and, you know, firing off a bunch of their workers to reduce production because they don't need to be storing any more of this stuff. And funny thing happens is um, when a bunch of people get fired, it uh, turns out they don't have much money to buy shit with. <laughs> and so when you have, uh, you have a whole bunch of uh, people all suddenly out of jobs and there's a whole bunch of great stuff to buy, like there's, oh, there's, there's, there's all these houses that are being left empty. There's, you know, there's, there's food, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's clothes, there's shoes, there's all these sorts of things. All the good things in life are just, they're just sitting there waiting for people to, to use them. And you have all these people desperately thinking, oh my God, if only I had some of this stuff. But the problem is you can't match up these needs with the products that would satisfy those needs under capitalism unless they can pay for it. Yeah. And fundamentally, capitalism does not pay the workers enough to buy all the goods that are being produced. So it will chronically and repeatedly go into crises of overproduction. This is why we get things like... Um, market uh, saturation, they call it. Yep, yeah, market saturation, absolutely. This is why we get things like, so in Brisbane, for example, uh, I believe the status is like, is it 12 or 15 empty houses for every homeless person in, uh, yeah, 12 in Brisbane? Yeah, 15, yeah, I think. Somewhere around there. It's somewhere in that range, anyway. Um, so you have these absurd situations where it's sort of like, you know, uh, where you have too much, too much good stuff to go around. And the problem is, when Australia goes into a, an economic crash, and I guarantee it absolutely will, the uh, whole world will, but Australia specifically will, um, quite badly in the next 18 months, you can talk to me later about that if you want, um, is um, when, when, we have this, when we have this crash, one thing that you will see, uh, and something that happened uh, 11 years ago in the States, um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to, to know, is you'll see a massive spike in homelessness coincide with a massive spike of empty houses. And also a massive spike in authoritarianism. Yes. Yes. Because that's... Oh, yeah. That's the other thing, when capitalism goes through a crisis, that they don't want workers to revolt, well, they can try to go and say, okay, the immigrants, these people, these people, these people, your enemies. Mm -hmm. The capitalist class get the working class, if they're not politically minded, to go, right, okay, side with fascism, and that actually gets them on side for 
you know, recruiting the masses of discontented, pissed off, unemployed people who aren't politically savvy like we are to defend the stupid state that's actually oppressing them and go and defend their state and become the trained monkeys for these idiots. Well, yeah, absolutely, because a, a period of crisis is a period of intensified class, uh, class conflict, and so, yeah. if the, uh, so if the ruling class can find ways to divert that energy off, like, you know, divert this massive amount of, uh, of, of, of rage and political energy off into something that is harmless to them, right? Like, blame the immigrants, blame the, you know, uh, blame whoever, right? Blame Just any scapegoat. Yeah, exactly. That takes the takes yeah. the uh, emphasis off a of class. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Blame the immigrants. Blame the gays. Blame the whatever. You know. Blame the unions. Blame anyone but capitalists. Blame yeah. the cap Blame the evil communists and anarchists. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's our fault. <laughs> yep. Um, oh, I mean, we do control. We do control everything, right? I mean, yeah, we're the you know, we're ones who create this problem, aren't we? Um, no. So we're. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So you can have crisis of overproduction, right? So. Um, other things that are, so other things, just really quickly talking about other sort of sites of crisis in capitalism, you have alienation of labor. So that's basically the idea of like, if, you know, if according to this sort of, uh, you know, point of Marx, we are fundamentally creatures, we are laboring creatures and we get our meaning from labor. We get our meaning from, uh, finding work that will, you know, like that's, that's how we, that will fulfill us, I guess. Yeah, nutrients for the soul. It's like nutrients for the soul, not just for the body and the mind, but nutrients for the soul as well as the body and mind. Spot on, right? We need to find stuff that, that we care about, that that we can, that gives us a legacy, yeah. gives us something we, uh, gives us some meaning. Exactly. We need that, right? Under capitalism, we are alienated from our labor because we labor in whatever ways are most profitable to the capitalists, not whatever ways are most satisfying to us, right? Yeah. So we have. Uh, so we've got that. Um, a few other things, right? There are more and more needs that are arising uh, as, you know, as sort of capitalism, you know, capitalism is very good at, uh, at solving human needs. Well, it's very good at solving human needs for those who can pay for it, is that take the form of like a product. They take the form of like, sweet, here's a thing in a box. We make a hundred million of them and we sell them off, right? Yeah. Here's an issue, here's a cure. Let's commodify the cure. Exactly. Now, the thing is, increasingly, especially as, you know, especially as things like alienation uh, become worse and worse, increasingly the things that people need are things that are very difficult to sell. Things like meaning, things like community, things like, you know, uh, uh, mental health, all these sorts of things. That is really fucking hard for capitalists to find a way to sell to people, right? And so increasingly, the economic needs of the society are uh, uh, are transcending the uh, like we we have the we have these needs to be fulfilled. We know we have the capacity to fulfill them. We don't have the capacity to make a profit off fulfilling them. So we've got again there is this the the sort of economic uh, structure the, the how should I say the development of productive forces is straining against the constraints of a system that has outlived its stay. Two other things to, to talk about for capitalism, right? So these are, we're talking about like fault lines, you know, sites of crisis for capitalism. Two other things to talk about here, right? Capitalism historically has always needed new markets to expand into. Capitalism has always needed an outside yeah. to expand into. And with, I mean, particularly with the fall of the Soviet Union in, you know, 1991, there isn't really an outside to expand into anymore for capitalism. There's no, there's no new markets to conquer. There's no new, uh, there's, there's nowhere to like, uh, pillage. There, there's nowhere, nowhere to pillage, nowhere to take over. And so the things like rate of tendency of the rate of profit to fall intensify ever more. And of course the big one, the one, well, the big one that is, I think on everyone's mind, particularly right now is inability to solve collective problems like climate change, right? And we all know this one exhaustively inside and out. I'm not going to yeah. bother with it, with explain this. You guys all get it. So, uh, anything else you want to add on the fault lines of capitalism? Nope. All right, I'm gonna to move to the last bit then. Last bit that Marx talked about, right? And this is actually a bit where he is, 
as we mentioned before, extremely vague. Because, and I, I think it's a credit to him that he was, you know, uh, he didn't indulge in what he criticised a lot of other socialists and anarchists and so on for at the time, which was like trying to come up with a perfect society, a vision of how a perfect society would work and all the rest. Like he was, I mean, well, to be fair, Marx was brutal to everyone. Like Marx was like, holy shit, Marx was like in a perpetual state of flame war with like everyone and everything. Um, that was a, there is a, there is a true poster and he loved to, you know, he loved to start, you know, he, he loved to start fights. Um, I mean, perfect example being uh, another another uh, influential uh, or a anarchist of the time, Max Stirner. Literally, there is more. There is more. Uh, I think. I think there is twice as much. I'm not sure exactly how much, but there is far more of like stuff written by Marx dunking on him than he ever wrote in his entire life. Like, literally, the, basically, the only reason why anyone knows who Max Stirner is today is because Marx just wouldn't stop being like, oh, look at this fucking moron. <laughs> yeah. So he he loves starting fights. I, but saw, anyway. I saw a picture of Marx and he's talking to Stern. He's like, egoism, isn't that just a fancy word for being an asshole? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And the Conan and Pontos, he jumped on them pretty good too. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, he, he loved, I mean, look, he started fights with everyone. Um, so he was basically an arsehole. Oh yeah. Look, yeah. <laughs> he was German, he was angry, he was pissed off, he was always angry. I was... Oh look, I here's the thing. I I I have I have an incredible I have a huge amount of admiration for, for Marx and I, I consider him well unambiguously the best uh, economist and social scientist of all time. But you are sure the best philosopher. But yeah, he was a total fucking asshole. Like holy shit, I don't wanna hang out with that guy. Well, yeah. I would want to hang out with him for a bit. But then I'd want to like I'd want to be able to leave because he would really get on your nerves. As an academic, not as a friend. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't want to get on the piss with him either. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the number of times he just got himself in Bar trouble, you know, starting. He'd kill you. Oh yeah, like again, you know, get, getting drunk and just like and smashing street lamps uh, while screaming about the state and the uh, the oppressive, you know, the oppression of the of the bourgeoisie and all the rest. This was like, uh, you know, this was a common occurrence for him. <laughs> uh, probably a decent part of why he never uh, finished Capital too, is because he, well, both because he was drinking too much and because that drink uh, probably caused him to die uh, uh, a lot younger than he should have. Anyway, but, um, so Talking about how things will change. So he talked about class consciousness, right? That these class, these classes exist and the class conflict will always exist, right? Well, so long as there is a class society. But you need, for there to be a change, you need there to be a consciousness of that class contradiction, right? And the thing is that as time's gone on, as, like, as we go through this material dialectic, right, this sort of thesis antithesis synthesis through different forms of economic production, the means of oppression gets a lot more abstracted over time. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to... Thank you for uh, talk. It, the means of oppression gets, of this sort of oppression gets a lot more abstracted over time and becomes a lot more... A lot more what? Abstracted. Sorry, abstracted. 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 Sorry, abstracted. Sorry, abstracted and uh, and harder to spot. Right, like if you're a slave, it's pretty easy to figure out who who your oppressor is. Right, it's the guy with the whip, you know, who can have you killed if you speak back to him. Right, it's pretty straightforward. If you're a peasant on a on a feudal on feudal lands, right, it's a little less straightforwardly obvious, but it's still pretty clear. Right, it's like, oh yeah, there's that fella, there's that fancy fella what lives up in the great big stone house and takes half my grain every year. Yeah, he's probably like, what an asshole, he's, he's probably my enemy, right? But when you get to the level of like, when you get to something like modern capitalism, especially sort of, especially at the sort of stage where we've gotten to, right, of, you know, like this sort of, this sort of stage of late capitalism, right? That sort of oppression is a lot harder to spot, right? People, it's a lot easier, like it's, People are very good at coming up with these mystifications, right? The social structure comes with these mystifications of like, oh no, the, the rich are job creators. They are, you know, oh, they God. are, you know, they they are the titans of industry. They they are driving society forward and all the rest. And and we all live by their, uh, we live benefiting from them, etc., etc., etc. Right? And so no one forces you to work. 
Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you don't like if you don't you like to work here, you can work somewhere else, right? As you take welfare, you're a filthy, dull, blazing piece of crap. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's also the myth of class mobility. Mm, yes. If you, yeah. take ta- if you don't pay tax, heroes. Well, it's, it's interesting. Working class people. Problem uh, so, so class mobility is uh, the the idea of uh, introducing meritocracy. Hmm. To, to, to make capitalism work. We need more efficient managers. Uh, we, we don't need an aristocracy to inherit it. We need hmm. people to earn their positions and work your way up. <clears throat> um, but the, the fundamentally, you're still reinforcing a, a class structure because you're moving up to take new positions to uh, re- retain what the society is. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, when I was, as I was saying before, when talking about like uh, Napoleon and so on taking over, you know, the sort of new synthesis that was created was, was basically a re-solidification of a very hierarchical class structure, mm-hmm. but just sort of saying, yeah, but you earn your way to the top now, yeah. right? Um, which was a huge advancement o- over just whichever inbred dipshit gets born into the, uh, you know, ends up with the job on the basis of coming out of the right vagina. Like that is, you know, like obviously that's not a particularly good way of, uh, of, of selecting your, your leaders, right? Um, but your, um, but yeah, it's still like yeah, class mobility still impl- like still requires a class yeah. structure, right? And of course, you know, and of course, a huge number of people like the vast majority of time you will die in the class you were born into, right? Of course, because what what we have is this delusion that people can move from one class to the other. But this this is probably more so in Australia and America because we have never had feudalism or a period, a period of feudalist development in Australia or the United States, unlike the Europeans. So we have never had that. So for not having that vital part of our social development as a country, we have this delusional fantasy that people can move up from one class to the other. Yeah, it's a fantasy that comes from the lack of having feudalism as a period of our development. I disagree with that, but I mean there is mobility, but it, it's uh, dependent on your resources to start with. Yeah, that's what and, I mean. And, and so, so a lot of uh, liberal politics is about you know giving more resources to the poor to find the the, the merit down there. That's mm-hmm. why you have uh, free education and uh, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing to support them. And uh, when when you when you take that away, then you take away the uh, yeah. the uh, the talent pool yeah. as such from the working class. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and one thing that. Um, one thing that Mark's talked about a fair bit in, in the context of this is um, is talking about how all of this is how like part of part of what capitalism has created is is create such intensely social labor that we cannot like it doesn't not only does it not even make sense it is not even possible to divide who makes what labor at a certain point anymore right like if if we're all working in a factory right if we're all working in a factory that makes cars right. And my job is just to make this one specific, like, is to, I don't know, apply the finish on one specific part of the engine out of, you know, with an engine that has 2,000 moving parts in it or whatever. Then how do I define, like, what part of the value of the car I've made? Yeah, I know what you mean. And then even more so, like, well, how do you define the value put in by the person who raised that worker as a child, right? Like that, that worker had to be a child at one point. How do you put the a value on the, you know, on the hours spent parenting that child or whatever, oh, yeah. right? Um, which is still part of that, right? You don't have that worker without all that emotional labor and without all that care and so on from yeah. parents and teachers and neighbors and you know, you know whatever. Yeah. And so part of this is like, is this idea of well, our labor becomes more more efficient as it becomes more social, as we sort of do more and more division of labor. Yeah. But also as we do that, the idea of trying to split up, well, who created what becomes more and more meaningless and becomes far more reasonable to just sort of say, well, it's, it's all of our labor. We just need to split it amongst us and, and get past the idea that we can define, oh, you put in more work than I did. At some point it just becomes like, I don't know, man, let's just, <laughs> let's, Let's so just share it. Their need. Yes. Well, each according is... to their abilities, each according to their needs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where we, we we'll get to that. So, Marx was extremely vague about how the overthrow of capital capitalism would happen. Um, he had he had some theories of his own, and he, he 
he clearly had some opinions about this in terms of his activism in the uh, in the First International and so on, but they never really got close enough to an actual revolution within his lifetime for him to really address a lot of those uh, concerns concretely. And um, he decided not to really, he didn't really spell out a lot of how this would work in his academic writing because I think fairly reasonably, he was basically like, a product of his generation. Yeah, he was a product of his generation and he was basically like, look man, I've been through one cycle of revolutions in 48 and I was totally fucking wrong. I have no, like, I... I don't have a crystal ball, man. I've done what I can to reflect the times I live in now. I mean, it's my time to drop off and... Exactly. He's sort of saying, look, here are some goggles for, for analysing the world, but I don't know where the revolution's going to happen. I don't know when. I don't know under what circumstances. I can't predict exactly how this is going to work and I can't tell you what the best strategy is. But what he did say, well, he says that society needs to, at some point, so there will be some sort of social revolution. And he says that there needs to be a transitional period of what he called a dictatorship of the proletariat. Yeah. Can anyone yeah. describe, explain to me what a dictatorship of the proletariat is? It's the oppression of the ruling class by the working class. Yes. Mm. Yes, spot on, right? Because if, basically he's sort of saying if the, if society has always been a dictatorship of the ruling class over the, the oppressors over the oppressed, right? Then... There needs to be, of one class over another. Yes. He's saying, he, basically what he's saying is, you don't just, it's not like you have a revolution and then you instantly make everyone, make us all equal, right? You need to have a period of dismantling old class privileges, right? In this case, it'd be a period of, you know, just like when, in the French Revolution, right? You had to, you had to have a, a period of, you know, of seizing all these aristocratic lands and, you know, and redistributing them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? You can't just do that overnight. You have to have this period of the systematic suppression and, uh, uh, what's the term? What? Right. Seizing of the goods of the, uh, of the, uh, the rich people. Seizing production of labor. Sure, sure. Seizing means production, right? Uh, so, um, confiscation, that was the word I was looking for. Um, you had a, a period of confiscation, right? And in that period, one thing that's got to be one thing that's got to be key, right, is that the society must, in that period, be ruled by the workers to the exclusion of the bourgeoisie, right? The bourgeoisie get no political, uh, basically, no political participation in that in that period because their their interests as a class are antithetical to that of the society. Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't at all necessarily mean uh, that they will be treated with violence or, or whatever, that's, I think that's, you know, historical um, evidence has shown us more that, you know, I mean, they, they will be violent towards the, the workers and try to suppress these things, uh, and so violence will uh, likely be needed in response, but that, it doesn't mean, you know, this sort of dictation of the proletariat doesn't mean that, you know, they need to be, like, treated cruelly beyond, beyond that. But it does mean that their interests are antithetical to the interests of the rest of society, and as such, they must be excluded from the political process for as long as they continue to exist as a bourgeoisie, they, yeah. as they, they continue to exist as a class that, ex, that extracts from others. But at the end of that period, so through the through the process of this period, you are you are not only dismantling the these sort of means of of extraction from workers, these means of political oppression of of the uh, of the workers by the capitalists, you're also fundamentally dismantling the state itself. Because, going back to the sort of old thing there, right? If the state is an apparatus of class oppression, if that is how it arose, if that is how it exists as a, as a mechanism of a ruling class to oppress a, a class that is ruled over, then as you dismantle, like as you dismantle a, a ruling class, as you destroy the distinction between classes and turn everyone into a single, you know, as you, as you create a class of society, the state itself ceases to exist because you don't need, because it will not, uh... It doesn't serve its primary function anymore. Yeah, basically it's like it, it no longer, it no longer has a, a purpose, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, this is, 
perhaps for a future educational, um, I would be extremely keen to do a much shorter, but um, do a sort of talk on uh, uh, on Lenin's State and Revolution, which talks about uh, talks about this, uh, how, how this works. But um, anyway, so he's sort of saying, okay, we're, by dismantling class structures, you're also dismantling the state in and of itself. Yeah. And the end point here that he's that we're sort of aiming towards. So you know, this sort of period of transition of dismantling class structures and dismantling the state, he called socialism, right? And then he's sort of saying, okay, the final point you're aiming towards, the point where all this has been destroyed, there is no state, there is no class, that final point is communism. And the key thing to define that is the principle of from each according to their ability to each. Hey, what's up? Oh, hey. There's no gigs on, is there? No. <laughs> Not tonight, no. Sorry, never mind. Uh, all good. Thank you. Yeah. I can sing, but you want to hear it. I just Um... Discussion. Yeah, you can come yeah. talk about Marxism with us. <laughs> so the key, the key defining thing about about that final state of, of uh, communism is both that the uh, both that we live that we live in both such abundance, like there is such uh, abundance of, of all goods in society, and there is no and no longer any need for like uh, for coercion. Right, that we can achieve a state, or we can achieve that sort of that credo of from each according to their ability to each according to their need. And what that means, to be clear, is that work itself has ceased to be a compulsion. That any that there is no need for that. No one is being in any way coerced into work or being like having to be like you know offered well if you work you'll get this thing. It's like no, you work because that is what fulfills you. And you work as you wish, where you wish, when you wish, on what you wish, because it's what fulfills you. Yeah. And you take, you take what you need to satisfy, you know, satisfy your own, uh, like your own uh, wants and needs, when and as as you wish, also without um, coercion. Yeah. And that's the sort of state that you're aiming towards. Now we can sort of have all sorts of conversations about how. Uh, you know how far off is that? How likely is uh, how likely is that to achieve in whatever time frame or so on? But that is sort of the logical endpoint there of a society without class, without state, without coercion, and with such incredibly developed means of production that minimal labour can produce abundance for all. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean that's basically the end of my uh, end of end of. Uh, what I've got in the notes. Does anyone have anything to add? Any questions? Anything we want to discuss? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I've I've always had issue with the um, basically the, the linear and dualistic nature that, that Marx puts out, mm -hmm. um, and 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 so his his uh, historical references are very much based on continental Europe, mm -hmm. but don't sort of, um, I mean, you can't know everything on, on the planet at that stage, obviously, but these, uh, <laughs> these surpluses that have existed in different sorts of societies all over the earth in different sorts of times without the, uh, the, the capitalist society that's been described here, and, and they've, they've come and gone. So, I mean, a uh, Roman society, for example, you could argue very well was a, a basically a capitalist society. You had private ownership, you had welfare, you had wage systems, you had slavery, you had free markets. Um, when, when it collapsed, you had the Dark Ages, which was basically a communal society across Europe. Um, the, 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 the church moved in and started advancing feudalism, um, and that was, that was patchwork. You know, there, there, there was different varieties going on here, here and there, a little bit different here and there. Obviously, feudalism was strong in various parts of Europe, um, but in, you know, in the North, you had Viking society where you had a surplus, and they didn't behave this way. Um, no, they didn't. They just went to England, Scotland, Wales, right, well, Yeah, yeah, well, that's, how, that's part of how they got their surplus. Um, but it wasn't through uh, extraction of labour, and then that surplus wasn't used to um, create... Uh, I mean, there, there was a distribution of wealth there, which was fairly egalitarian for a time until the, the, the Christians got into it. So I, I think there's a, there's a multiplicity of things that are going on there, which um, uh, can be a little bit uh, economically reductionist uh, in, in certain ways. Well, you have to look at Marx and only in the historical context that it was put in. I mean, when he was in Europe and what he did was in the historical context, he lived 
and the society he lived in. He did an angles actually, if you read, I've got a really good book you should actually read. It's called Private Property and the, Fa and the Family by Frederick Engels. You should really mm. read that because it goes into a lot of details about Celtic societies, Roman, Indigenous societies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's called The Origins of Private Property and the Family. And he goes into the value of family and how that they use that. And he does go, even reference Australian Aboriginal societies and yeah. others in his work. So there's more... Well, yeah, so, so Aboriginal society is another example of a uh, surplus yeah. being produced. Um, and uh, so, so in one way, yeah. the, the uh, economic determinism is also mitigated by, by, by cultural factors. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it goes forwards and backwards. There's a multiplicity of things happening. Yeah. Um, it's not what he said, uh, this determines this. You know what I mean? And, and, and that means that humans have, a, have an ability to create a revolutionary society without uh, uh, an, an economic crisis. You can... Have, a, have people want to live differently, have an understanding, um, organise differently within a, a structure now and, and, and just make shit happen. Um, that's really hard, obviously, um, yeah. but you know, the, the potential is definitely there. And it's, you don't need to wait until a, a, a thing to happen and think it will flow onto something else. Um, that's kind of... And I, obviously he said that this about Marx. He, he wasn't trying to be determinist about how, how you do this, but he just said this is how things sort of flow from one, 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 one. This is yeah. what, I, what I've seen. And, I think, uh, yeah. Well, it's like Lenin built on what, on what Marx wrote, so it's like building the foundations of a house. First you put down the slab, then you've got to build up and build up one level. So, of course, when society evolved from Marx's days to Lenin's days, he saw the start of imperialism and the old ideology of imperialism, World War I and post-World War I, post society. So he was building on what Marx had already done. So it's like the second level of building on the slab and the foundations Marx had built. Mm. And he's building up from that level because society evolved. You can't like... Like, I, I feel like there has to be a crisis in society, you know, like, yeah. You know, there were other socialists around, like Blanqui and stuff, who attempted to mount insurrections. You know, when the mm. when the working class weren't behind behind them, and they just ended up in jail. You know, um, you know, and uh, I think you know, when it, whenever you've seen a, a revolutionary upheaval, it, it you know, there's always associated with a crisis. You know, uh, people. People are ground down, and then there can be a spark, and then then people respond. You know, um, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think, think it was possible to make a revolution in the 1950s. You know, as capitalism was expanding, you know, there were up, revolutionary upheavals in places like Hungary and stuff. You know, where there was intense Cuba. Ex exploitation and stuff, but um, mm. um, well, that's also yeah, 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 so, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, like, the diggers, uh, I, I don't know, it depends if you describe that as an economic crisis, but the English Civil War was, was certainly a, a confrontation. Um, uh, and, and part of it was a spur, spur of capital, but, but also part of it was just a simple uh, desire to be free and a desire to overthrow the ruling class. Mm -hmm. um, that, but that, that arose out of the revolutionary crisis, didn't it? Like, there was, like, uh, um, like, the king needed money. <laughs> he called the parliament. The parliament, you know, weren't going to hand over the money unless they had, you know, more, more sort of say. There was, you know, a rising bourgeoisie in that society, um, and and a, and a feudal society, and, and it, it uh, opened up this struggle. Within that, you know, like Cromwell. It's true, but the, the, the diggers themselves. Yeah, you know, their, their ideas were were created from just the, the, the compulsion to want to live free and equally. Yeah, yeah, but you know they they come to the fore during the English Civil War, don't they? You know, like Cromwell actually mobilizes the New People's Army. You know, so he's a bourgeoisie, but he needs to mobilize the masses. He mobilizes the masses, and then once once he's he's what uh, you know let the the genie out of the bottle. <laughs> you know. They, they don't always just follow the way he wants. And, and the diggers and um, the levellers mm. were, were some sort of groupings of, like I suppose you would say, uh, very uh, 
the proletariat in a very embryonic form, mm -hmm. you know, uh, arose out of that. You had similar things in, in the revolution in Paris, you know, the, the, um, what were they called? Saint Coulot. Yeah, Saint Coulot. You know, the, yeah. some, you know, the, the masses wanting to go further than, than the people, you know, at the top, you know, who initiated the revolution in some ways, you know. But I think it's also, I think it's notable that like, you know, sort of communist and anarchist ideas in some sort of, in a, in a kind of a, a, a vague form have existed, have basically always existed in, in just about every society. But it's it's only I, I think I think the thing you're know, sort of getting at is that it's it's the periods of crisis it's periods of some sort of other crisis that allow them to flourish. Now that doesn't mean that organising outside like organising in preparation for the, that crisis isn't important. It's incredibly important. But like yeah, you have like you know as you mentioned the diggers or I mean another great example is. Uh, the, the Munster Rebellion uh, in the midst of the, the Protestant Reformation, right? Like the sort of the political uh, rift that opened up in the Protestant Reformation uh, allowed for this, you know, I mean, strange and very culty, but still uh, communist uh, <laughs> sort of, um, you know, sort of vaguely anarcho-communist-ish uh, experiments uh, then. Um, and I think, like, I think your your criticism of it, of like the sort of, I guess you want to call it, yeah, like vulgar Marxist sort of, you know, extremely linear deterministic uh, interpretation. I, I think that that, I think you're you're quite right to be critical of that in the sense of, oh no, there is, there is a single progression of history. There is primitive communism, then there is the ancient mode of production with slavery, then there is feudalism, then there is capitalism, then there's socialism, then there's communism. It's like, yeah, that's that. Like he was describing. He was basically describing what was happening in what had happened in Western Europe by and large through the last few thousand years, but I think it's I think it's very obvious that like across human societies it's been far more like a branching tree, right? There's been many different there's been many different paths that different societies have gone along and the specifics of their economic the specifics of the economic conditions that they were under and specifics of their technological developments led to different types of economic systems that made sense for their context. So like, for example, I mean, the, the sort of model, of, the sort of tribute model of the Chinese states uh, was, would have been completely unviable anywhere in Europe, right? Because of, just because of the geography of the area, right? And mm -hmm. the lack of ability to control things like the water supply of, of farms, um, which gave the empire, the empire its power in China. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, I think the, like a lot of, a lot of stuff that's built on this, and especially a really good person, a really good person to read, I highly, probably my favourite, like, possibly my favourite sort of Marxist academic after, like, you know, after like Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, the sort of the, 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 the major ones like that, is um, Silvia Federici and her book The Caliban and the Witch, uh, where she talks specifically about the process of uh, of sort of the change from feudalism to capitalism, both in the Americas and in Europe, in terms of like accumulation, like in terms of accumulation, class struggle, these sorts of like peasant revolts and so on, and how how peasant revolts arose, were put down, and how like our whole modern conception of human nature, and particularly in her case, of the thing she emphasizes is our modern conceptions of gender were created in that crucible of class struggle in the context of these these types of rebellions you're talking about, um, mm. which I, I reckon you find super just, interesting. Yeah, okay. Just, oh, cool. Sorry, just going back to what yeah. I said about the, yeah, yeah. the diggers, because I, I think I probably put it a bit crudely, because I do think there were probably people who had those Excuse sorts me, of... which diggers are you speaking of? Yeah, they English Civil War. Okay, they, oh, proto communists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm thinking, where would you explain yeah, through um, you're yeah. in this okay. <laughs> 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 um, like I do think, yeah, there was pro those ideas probably existed in English society, you know, long before the revolution, you know, amongst the very small minority of people, you know, and I think you can see that here today, you know, St John the Poor, right, led a peasant revolt in the 1300s, yeah, uh, almost overthrew the king. Yeah. Well, what, what I was going to say is like, you look at capitalism. There's people who can visualize a socialist society, 
mm. you know, or some sort of society collectively run without capitalism. They're a small minority of people, you know, for, for different reasons, you know, we, we can see that because we've had different experiences and, and, and drawn that out. Now, I think with, the, with the, the diggers and some of those sorts of people, you know, they, you know, there would have been people around with those sorts of ideas long before the, the revolution. But for those ideas, you know, to, to sort of become a, a social force in society and connect, with, they, they need to connect with wider layers of people and, and, and usually that happens in some sort of, sort of uh, crisis, I think, you know. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, sure, sure. The English king was taxing everybody, but every feudal king did that, and so often it was just these ideas that spurred a, a revolt against the, the, these taxes. I mean, every feudal lord did the same thing, but these revolts didn't happen in other parts of Europe. But it was specifically because, but no, I think, but I think the, the key thing here is that there was a far more advanced form of capitalism in England. Uh, at least on a scale, on a larger scale, there, there were more, there's more advanced capitalism in like say Venice, but it was a city state, so it didn't have the same dynamics. But like in mm. terms of a large country with both city and, and, uh, and rural areas, England was by far the most advanced capitalist society at that point. And so you had far more of a rising economic class with real economic power that was politically unrepresented. <clears throat> You know, you, you had that sort of that vaccine <coughs> condition, right, of the of the new economy bursting through, you know, like stringing against the, you know, stringing against the, uh, uh, the existing political order that was holding it back. Um, so it's not just about the ideas. It's not that England had more advanced like ideas than the rest of Europe. It's that they just had more advanced like capitalist production, cap uh, more advanced capitalist class and more, you know, mm -hmm. It was being held back more by monarchy than anywhere else, so it was the place where the rupture happened. <coughs> or, or another example would be the American Civil War. So you've got slavery in the South, and you've got the development of um, uh, yeah, capitalism in the North, right? And there's there's a dispute about uh, as they expand west about whether there is going to be slavery in the new states or, or free enterprise in the new states, you know, and uh, they tried to contain it for a long time and it eventually uh, breaks out into war, you know. But, you know, there were, there were abolition, you know, Lincoln was not an abolitionist, you know. Uh, he was happy to live with slavery so long as the Western states weren't slavery, you know. Uh, the, the, but there were abolitionists in American <coughs> society long before that. But you know, there's, there was like a, uh, a fight amongst the elite. And that, uh, in, in the process of having to fight that war, Lincoln actually kind of moved to the left and actually uh, brought in the proclamation that freed the slaves and uh, there, was, there was radicalism happened out of that. You know? So it, it kind of began with a, uh, a, a, a crisis, you know, between conflicting um, uh, class structures, I think, you know, that, that opened up the, the space, you know, for, for other things to happen, you know, and it, for it to become more radical in, 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 in parts, it was rolled back. But, but yeah. I think in, in fairness to Lincoln, mm. uh, it's like all sorts of wonderful people we place on pedestals, <coughs> looking at feet of clay, I mean, Lincoln, mm. Famously or infamously, Maury paraphrased said basically, if I could save the Union by freeing one slave, I would do. Mm. If I could save the Union by not freeing one slave, I would also do so. Yeah. Mm. And it's funny when people talk about Lincoln being an abolitionist and that sort of stuff, I think he's more a political opportunist. Mm. We mm -hmm. saw a movement which he could co-opt or dragoon. I mean, it's based the same man who who approved the greatest max execution in the history of the United States. I, I think, I think no, it was... Which was? When those horrible red Indians had the fucking temerity to say, this is our country. <laughs> yeah. Boy, yeah. Or yeah. Or that, this was after slavery. I, no, this was after slavery? Mm, well, no, must they got shot like two days after the war ended. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. he was a bummer. I, I think it was the, the circumstances of the war that forced him to, mm. to move to the to the left, if that's the right word, you know, because they fought, a, they fought, uh, they began to fight just like a, um, 
what's the sort of war, you know, like a one army versus another army, you know. Set piece. A set piece war, you know. And the, and the North wasn't winning, you know. And they needed to win. And the way to, to do that, you know, uh, was to, you know, to free the slaves, you know, and... Uh, and, and and arm the blacks, you know, and uh, oh, no, so that they, so no, that they, no, no, they no. fight for their own for their no, own liberation. No. Yeah. Given the amount, I mean, mm. in actual fact, mm. slaves in the southern state were recruited and armed to fight for the south. Mm. There was whilst there were some black mm. troops on the north, mm. it wasn't enough, to, I believe. And I studied the Civil War for forty years. I think one of the most written things after the Bible is the Battle of Gettysburg. And that was it. That, that didn't. It wasn't there. They had. The, they had. For God's sake, going with it. They had what the South didn't have: industry, heavy industry, industrialisation. Yeah, if you, um, I sort of remember yeah. there weren't that many slaves in the North. But, no, and if they were in the North. They were not slaves, so you weren't freeing a slave to conscript them into the army. No, that's right. See, the the, the slaves didn't run from the from the from the from the north to the south. They ran from the south to the north. How many? Right, lots of them. How many? Uh, ten, ten, ten. And and as the, as the armies, of armies of as, yeah, but as the army as the the um, the Union armies marched through, you know, the slaves didn't go defend the south. No, I think that's more of a. I think one thing that's probably more relevant here mm -hmm. was the the number oh, of radicals. Oh, sorry, keep going. I've got a couple of options. Oh yeah, I'm going to get a train. Oh, okay, sure. The, the number of radical, the number of like radicals who fled Europe after nineteen uh, after 1848, who were willing to who were willing to like pick up guns and fight and so on. Yeah, if, yeah. if they were like, if they if they heard that sort of radical stuff uh, being reflected back to them, right? It's like. You had, like Lincoln, I think, was was far more like, oh wait, I've got all these radicals who will like, they will fight and, they are fanatics, they will fight and die if I can, if I can convince them, no, no, this is a crusade for human liberation, yeah. because they really believe that. And so I think that is actually an instance of, of like a, of an under, of underclass power of like, when a, a ruling class is split, and like half of it sort of falls away, the... The, the sort of the the, power, the passion and the the sort of demand for reform from the the underclass can really bend the the uh, ruling class to their demands. And if he hadn't been shot, you know, the I mean, all the construct plans for reconstruction were very radical. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, by the sense of the time, they did not end up going through. But you know, no. so if you look at the tens of thousands of people exactly who you just described, Penny, mm -hmm. who were there, who were new immigrants, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Couldn't speak fucking English, mm. and one, two, three of the probably the, the more successful of the Union general, that is many, um, were had Germanic names. And a bunch of them were like communists too. Like and a bunch of them were They could speak, but a lot of the people who were for newly arrived immigrants who were working in the country, like the rural setting, who were working in industry, and what you said, mm. we just copped this shit in fucking Europe. That's why we're here. Mm. And we didn't win over there. We got a fucking chance to do it here, mm. and that's what they did. Thank mm. you all very much. Yeah, nice. Good, to see you. Good night. Good see you tomorrow. Thank you. Um, nice one. Um, I Actually, think we're regarding your um, criticism of Marx's like linear idea of the stages of society, maybe if instead of viewing it as like linear and time, you view it as linear with like levels of production, like maybe. Uh, like capitalism has a higher level of production than feudalism, and feudalism has a higher production level of production than um, primitive communalism. I guess I don't know what came before feudalism. Uh, I mean, well, slave society in the traditional thing, although it's that makes it a bit more complicated because early, because like the late like slave societies of the Roman Empire were actually more productive than the early feudalist societies. That was a, more of a case where like you know that whole like you know. One class didn't triumph with the other, they both sort of destroyed each other. Mm. But anyway, sorry, go on though, go on. Mm. Um, yeah, and then like what uh, you're saying with um, as capitalism develops and it gets more productive, it runs into these crises. So, like uh, when 
when we hopefully get to socialism and communism, it'll be because we have le reached a level of production to cause these crises to throw us into these things. So mm -hmm. maybe these stages, as opposed to like a linear of time, it's linear level of production, maybe. Well, I mean, uh, one, one of the things we didn't talk about was uh, the artificial nature of scarcity, that scarcity uh, is, is a social construct on one level. It, it doesn't exist, but there's, there's always been enough. Um, uh, and and then that's, that's why you throw things in the bin. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's why, say, uh, avocado farmers who can't sell their, or tomato farmers who can't sell at a certain price, would rather throw it in the bin than, than give it to people for free. Um, so we've always had this level of production which is able to cover human needs. Um, except in situations, obviously, a uh, crop failure and uh, um, these sort of stuff. Um, so, I mean, the, these conditions have always been there on one level or, on, or another. I mean, obviously, the, the mass of production now is, is through the roof. Um, and so you'd think that there's, there's way more capacity to, to, to share now than there has been, but there's been a, a capacity for a, a very long time. Um, it's just... I, th I think also, like, that's a little thing I disagree with you. You said agriculture. Uh, classes um, now. Well, what's agriculture? Horticulture. Um, yeah. Now, because I think what you saw is like I think hunter, um, you know, what are the, uh, hunter gatherers. Sorry, I'm not sure if that's the right term to use these days. But mm -hmm. that was like a form of communism. You know, there was no state. You know, the relationships were egalitarian, etc. You know, and then uh, production rises. To a certain level, and they they have um, like horticulture, you know, which is like it's not very sophisticated agriculture. You know, it's a lot of a lot of hoe work. Um, you know, a lot of the the societies like um, uh, Melanesians, a lot of the Melanesian societies in PNG and pa uh, Polynesian societies were horticultural. Across the middle of Africa, it's very horticultural, and and women played a lot of. Uh, a, a, important role in in the farms you know and you look at those societies they whilst they were more uh, stationary they still had a lot of the old um, uh, ethos from the pre, uh, prior societies you know like they'd share things you know they, they, there was you could see the beginnings of um, uh, segmentation you know uh, there was often a, a big chief in, in, in the village and stuff, but they, they had different sorts of sets of obligations and they didn't sort of systematically live off the wealth of the other. You could yeah. still, still see there was like an element of, of yeah. both together, you know. It, it was sort of further on when they started to build dams and um, uh, um, agriculture became more intense, you know. There was a sharper division of labour and then that's when you really had the separation out of consolidated classes you know? yeah, yeah and, that, and that's entirely fair I, I sort of I made it mm. I stated it as a as a sort of a binary switch which it mm. very much which is ahistorical that's you're, you're entirely right that it's not it's a continuum and as that as you go through that continuum and you develop a surplus that and develop enough of a surplus that you can have people mm. you know non-productive people you get that but yeah no you're right it's it's a lot more continuous than I was uh, than I was describing. So yeah, no, thanks for so there were, there were societies that did produce some sort of surplus, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, uh, people weren't absolutely poor scratching every day, mm -hmm. uh, and that were you know sort of classless, but you know it had its limitations, I suppose. You know. mm. I mean, yeah, well, the Indus Valley civil yeah. civilization is an interesting example too. They were. Mm -hmm. They were a classless, stateless society, although mm. they didn't, I mean, they didn't last for very long, but they were, uh, you know. Yeah. The, early, the early, you know, when they first sort of began to settle on the Turkish plains, mm. you know, uh, they found, they found uh, grasses that grew naturally that they could harvest, you know, and they didn't actually need agriculture, you know, but then there was actually climate change that came along and they actually had to uh, develop uh, more, uh, either revert back into a sort of uh, hunter-gathering type mm. society or, you know, mm. develop um, um, agriculture, you know, and, and find ways to grow it themselves, you know, not just rely on what was there already in a natural way, you know. Yeah, I guess and, that's one thing that's missing is and, and uh, that, that ecology. That was for thousands of years, actually, some of those 
areas like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's something that Marx doesn't touch on at all. Is it's ecology, and you know, there's there's reasons that you know, Europe just the concept just did not exist in people's heads. Um, but if you're going to talk about economic systems, well, then that's that's a fundamental component. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's actually although there's there's an interesting there's actually a really interesting thing there. Um, in I can't remember which which one it is. Marx does actually prefigure a bunch of that stuff there. He talks about a I think all. Uh, talks about a metabolic rift, which is interesting okay. in terms of like, basically, basically sort of presaging that in terms of like, it, it, they didn't, they didn't really have the language to talk about ecology because it just didn't, didn't language exist. didn't exist at that, exist that point, right? But he starts talking about like a metabolic rift with nature, that there is basically that capitalism is this break because it is this system that's, that's outputs, that, is, that isn't a closed loop anymore. Its outputs don't turn back into inputs. Um, and that it can, it's, it takes in inputs that it doesn't replace and it creates products that, it creates uh, outputs that have no way of being absorbed and that this creates this like tear in the fabric of nature basically. Um, actually there's a really... And, and the, yeah, right. the example he used was that the, the land was mm. becoming more and more exhausted. Yes! And they're bringing the food into the cities and, and yeah, people, okay. would, people would um, put basically and, and go out the right. ocean you know not back into the soil whereas um, once it, um, it would you know and he recognized that that's what capitalism was doing you know? so, yeah yeah exactly okay, cool. the nutrients in the human the nutrients in the food yeah. being flushed out into the ocean rather than being returned to the soil because yeah yeah and that's yeah I was, I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to but so I guess he yeah. did in a way acknowledge ecology but, but, yeah 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 just uh, obviously as a Industrial Europe uh, had destroyed any concept of ecology to its development. But there is some really good, um, I'm trying to think, there's a, there's a particular theorist who like really develops on this uh, to a huge extent. Yeah, uh, it's like a, like a Marxist sort of theory of ecology. Um, Bellamy Foster? Bellamy Foster? Yes. Yeah, John Bellamy. Is it John, John Bellamy Foster? Foster. Yes, Foster. yes, that's the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, um, hmm. I can't remember the, the name of, of the book I, of his I read, but yeah. uh, anyway, I read a book of his a long time ago. But, but yeah, no, it's. And I think it's, I think that that is actually a really productive thing is to try to synthesize, especially something like Marxism, because it's so economically focused with something like ecology, because, well, as someone who studied uh, economics uh, a lot, right, the connections there are extremely close, or at least when you're doing them right, like if you're doing economics mm -hmm. right, it should basically be almost continuous and it should be basically continuous with ecology, because it is effectively a social ecology, it is the, the ecology of society. And it is, and and it it ties in with the ecology of nature, you know. Yeah, no, like I said, uh, uh, economy is a social function, mm. and uh, it's it's entirely reliant on the, uh, the ecological si situations of the time, and you can do things to manipulate it. Um, you can have techniques to change it um, to become more productive, and you, know, you can talk about permaculture and that sort of stuff as well. Mm. Um, but all these are social systems, and social systems are human created, which means. Um, you can create new ones. I think. I think the other thing about the ecology is too is like, if you look look at the drive, of the competitive drive of capitalism, they're always like, they do things that are in their short term interest, but it ends up being in their long term interests. You know, so they, one person cuts wages, then all of them cut wages, and then all of then there's no, the market has contracted. You know. Yeah. One one introduces new productivity, all the others follow. And that brings the economy down. Yep. Think about, I think, you look at the environmental crisis, that's what's holding them back now. You know, like, nobody wants to, uh, well, if we, if we don't use coal, you know, they say, to generate power, we'll be at a, a competitive disadvantage. Or well, we're not going to use, use uh, get rid of it. If you're not going to get rid of it, you know, and uh, even though, I suppose, in a, in a, in a in a collective way, it would it's in their interest to save the planet that we're on, you know, but because they're all in competition with each other, mm. they, they can't um, actually deal with it, you know, so. Yeah, it's, 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 competition it's, it's, sort of destroys the human will. Mm. It leaves yeah, it's everyone, even the ruling class, subject to its whims. Yeah, yeah, like when I was young, I couldn't understand why would somebody with billions of dollars 
want to invest their money to get even more billions. You know, mm. like a billion sounds like you could live pretty comfortably, but it's it's because they they are in a competitive environment. If they're not constantly accumulating capital at say uh, at the, at maximum rate and reinvesting, you know, that eventually they go broke. You know, and mm. you know that's so. Uh, yeah, uh, I, that's the the irrationality of it. You know, but they are the capitalist class are caught up in that that you know, dog eat dog competition. You know, and it and it will it it also leads to uh, military competition. Yeah, so. I gotta go, but thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah.